I would like to welcome our first keynote speaker. The first speaker is Christian Basin. He is the CEO of the Danish Design Center. He has written seven books about design and innovation, and actually, he, you have my, uh, you are sort of, you have made the best definition from seen from my perspective of of what design is and what you can do with design. I use it every time I teach, so thank you for that. Uh, please come to the stage, and I think that you will need no further presentation. The floor is yours. Thanks, can you hear me okay? So, uh, good morning everyone, and, uh, and sorry for um, <clears throat> disrupting the program or moving to the top of the list, uh, but somebody else wants me somewhere else in Culling this morning. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure uh, that Culling is becoming, uh, over many years now, such a hotspot for design and uh, progressive ways of working with design, and also uh, this week such an international hotspot. Also, I'm really uh, uh, proud that we can celebrate uh, the best of Danish design this evening uh, with the Danish uh, Design Awards, which we're doing in collaboration with our partners here in Kolding, uh, and which is uh, an attempt to kind of showcase uh, the best contemporary uh, Danish design it's all in all its, uh, its scope. Now, the... Um, a title and the sort of the, the uh, 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 brief I got from, for this morning's presentation uh, was slightly ambitious in terms of how much time we have. Uh, however, I'll try my best to uh, address uh, what's going on with design uh, in the world and in Denmark when it comes to social innovation uh, and even uh, maybe point to some ways uh, forward. Um, Something should probably be popping up on the screen. Oh, it doesn't. Behind me in a moment. Yeah, no. Nope. Problem. Okay, I'll just start. I'll just uh, start uh, talking, and then we'll see if the technology uh, get gets uh, gets working. Um, so, first of all, uh, my background is uh, coming from uh, basically from social sciences and from public management, and moving into uh, running the Danish government's innovation team, which is called Mind Lab. And MindLab has now existed since about 2001 as um, an internal uh, team consisting of designers and anthropologists and uh, policy makers uh, working across the Danish government. And currently, I'm leading the Danish Design Center. So the last two and a half years, I've been running the Danish Design Center. And the Danish Design Center is uh, similar to, for example, the UK Design Council. Uh, and uh, uh, Design Council Singapore and others that are working to uh, expand the use of design across uh, business and society. So I'll, I'll just kind of say a little bit uh, in, about what we do, but then I'll sort of dive into this, uh, this sort of uh, uh, challenging theme, and I'll try to balance both a global view but also some Danish uh, examples. Uh, let's see, this is, of course, going to be switched on here. So. Um, we also, uh, well, soon uh, are uh, in, an, uh, in a, a nice uh, physical environment like we are in today. Uh, this building is being completed in, uh, on the waterfront in Copenhagen. And I think, in a way, it's an example of how design is becoming central to uh, government and social initiatives. So this building is financed by a philanthropy, Real Dania in Denmark. It's also uh, created together with the city of Copenhagen and with the government of Denmark, with particularly the Ministry of Business. It's called Blocks, uh, due to its, uh, probably its, uh, its physical uh, the way it looks. But it's more than a building, it's an innovation hub for architecture and design and the built environment, uh, which is this collaboration across uh, philanthropy and government, local and national, uh, and in includes uh, a wi wide array of uh, research institutions that are invited to contribute with um, and have funded PhD uh, research. And the interesting thing for me is that this ambition of uh, creating this uh, platform and hub for architecture and design uh, with a focus on solving global challenges and creating new opportunities for both Danish businesses and for Danish uh, uh, government, at the heart of that is design. And actually, we just uh, finalized the uh, strategy for the hub, and in the middle of the whole strategy model is design DNA. 
So for us, it's really exciting to, to, to be part of that, and it's actually a, it's a national initiative, so something that's uh, also a place like calling a School of Design is part of as well. So this is what we try to do, and I think that when it comes to design, whether it's for business innovation or for social innovation, or for innovation uh, in, uh, in uh, emerging sectors, um, leadership in all its forms, whether it's leading change in a project, it's leading a team, it's leading an organization, it's leading a government, leading a country, it's all um, about, uh, I think for us, to help leaders understand the power that design can have for them. So when we talk about leadership, it's, it's, it's in all its scales. It's leading a student project. It's leading uh, at national scale. Uh, but inviting in leaders of all walks of life, all professionals, all backgrounds, to experience the power of design, if we can succeed with that, and that's what we try to do at the Danish Design Center, then uh, we're pretty confident that then leaders will find a way to tap into the resources that are in a place like we are today, or that are across a country like Denmark, or the design resources that are available globally. Um, you, you're not supposed to read this in detail, but just to say that when we talk about social innovation and change, uh, and with the background I had coming from MindLab into uh, leading the Danish Design Center, uh, we have this mission to expand design into all sectors of society. Uh, we build a model that looks like this. And the model basically starts with scanning hor the horizon, understanding changes in society, co-designing or co-creating solutions together with partners, and then scaling. And to me, the question of scale, moving from prototypes to programs and to scale, again, in, in any kind of sector you can think of, is, uh, is, is the critical question. And then, of course, measuring and documenting whether, whether what you're doing works at all. And to me, it's been a really interesting journey to try to build a model like this and begin to work with programs from small prototyping scale to big scale. And let me give you just one example of what that might look like, which I think is also an example of how design can be used for social innovation. So, these are shipping containers. And what we're doing right now at the Danish Design Center is to work with a very range, a big range of partners to create future scenarios for healthcare. So we're creating scenarios for the future of health in 2050. And we're doing that together with the Danish government, with Danish regions, with local governments, we, with uh, Novo Nordisk, which is a big pharmaceutical company, with the entire medical device industry, with two uh, major hospitals. But scenarios often become very abstract and very sort of uh, futuristic and almost like science fiction. So the uh, company uh, Maersk has donated a handful of containers to us so we can build the scenarios ex as experiential prototypes that you can simply walk into as a doctor, as a nurse, as a patient, as a citizen, as a business leader, as an innovator, as a startup, and begin to have new conversations about possible futures for health. And I think this invitation to experience the power of design in making futures concrete and tangible, experiential, and then using design as a way to create new dialogues and new conversations across uh, different sectors in society is one way to think about how can design drive social innovation, societal innovation, as a way to make futures tangible for us at a time when health and healthcare is being transformed massively and where we in Denmark, for example, are wondering whether 10 or 15 years from now, uh, Google or Facebook will actually be running our healthcare system because they will have the data and they'll have the user interactions with, uh, with, with citizens. So, and these are from some of the books. What I'll talk a little bit about is some of the experience behind, uh, behind the research we've been doing. And uh, the, the latest book to the right is just published this year. It's also based on a, on a PhD project on leading design in government. And what, it, what does it take for, for managers across uh, five different countries uh, to, uh, to uh, leverage design for change and across all kinds of policy domains from social services to family services to um, uh, business development. And actually one of the case studies, the one that opens up this entire uh, book and the PhD is actually, she's here in town uh, this uh, week, uh, Carolyn Curtis from uh, Family by Family in Australia. So I would say that the pattern I've been seeing and, and tracking over the years is how design is entering into government in a very, very powerful way. It might still be small scale, but the location of design as a capability and as a skill is really being embedded. So just a few examples. Uh, here are a couple of countries, and uh, even though those countries are, of course, all the time going through different political stages and changes and so forth, each of these countries 
and many, many more, about 100 uh, government organizations, or if not more, around the world have established innovation teams and labs where design is a critical, critical uh, piece, if not the most uh, foundational uh, capacity or, or, or skill. Uh, so these are the, the names of the different labs, and, these, uh, and uh, there are more usually in these countries, but these are some of the most important ones. Believe it or not, European Union has an innovation team or innovation lab. Uh, and I actually checked it out uh, last night. They actually do have a website now, and they're t saying a little bit about what they're doing, working with design, working with uh, foresight, and working with behavioral uh, insight. So MindLab, this is a, a photograph, I think, taken from, uh, from the building that MindLab is in, in the heart of Copenhagen. And the reason I, I, I've taken this image along is that I think that part of the Danish experience is that Denmark was, if not the first, then among the first, to begin to embed design and as, a, as a practice, as a, a profession, but also as a set of, of uh, methodologies and processes inside uh, government. And that's probably played a role in that scaling and spreading of, uh, of, uh, of design uh, around the world. Uh, but of course, it's also interesting to look under the hood a little bit and say, okay, what's, what's in the Danish experience and, and, and what's been going on uh, on there? Before I do that, I think that uh, it's important to understand that that, uh, that the Danish experience is a way of, uh, of maybe sort of catalyzing, but also a reflection of a wider tectonic shift in how design is, is being uh, practiced. And this tectonic shift, it's very, very hard to assess uh, the scale of it in terms of you know, what percentage of design uh, work and design skill are now organized and focused on social innovation and what fraction or percentage is focusing on creating more stuff in business uh, or maybe pursuing new ways of doing business. Uh, new ways of doing circular, or doing sharing, and so on, which is arguably some of the major things that are going on. But uh, looking at uh, sort of the field from my vantage point, um, these are sort of the um, the main uh, the main shifts, uh, and and they seem to be uh, uh, picking up pace, uh, picking up power, uh, and we see more and more uh, designers uh, uh, pursuing uh, collaborative design, design for social impacts, uh, and we're also seeing as we have seen for the last five or ten years, interest in management around what design can do. So in, um, in my research, I've looked at, uh, not least in Denmark, but also in other countries, what, what makes uh, social innovators and, uh, and managers uh, choose to engage with design and designers. And here are three, not, it's probably the top three uh, reasons why uh, people engaged in social change uh, choose or come about to work with designers. Um, and one is financial pressure, and I don't think you can uh, overestimate the role of the financial crisis and the, sort of that global turbulence in terms of looking for new solutions and looking for new ways of doing government uh, or doing social change when resources are, are diminishing. And without that catalyst, I, I don't think we would have seen quite that shift. We also see that those leaders who engage with design are people who are driven by a vision. It can be a vision that the organization has, it can be a political vision, or it can be a very personally held vision of, for example, government can make a difference in people's lives. We can show and demonstrate that government and social services can be as attractive and as cool as anything the private sector can come up with. Um, when you have uh, models where there's free choice, how do we make sure that citizens also choose the government option? Uh, and finally, and there is a role to play for design promotion programs. I just have to say this. In many cases, when you look at when leaders in civic or social or government organizations work with designers, there has been some degree of catalyst. There's been a grant, there's been a program, there's been some kind of intervention, meaning that it's been accessible for them to make that step into a very different way of, uh, of uh, working. So uh, the Danish story, I'll just give a few headers and then uh, I'll give a, 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 a couple of examples, at least one, one, uh, one new example. Um, so here are a couple of cities and, uh, and local levels in Denmark. And I think that uh, in addition to MindLab, uh, which has been around since 2001, uh, the Danish experience is that uh, cities, local governments, and to some extent regions, and there are many more than these. These are just what could fit into the slide with a pitch big enough so you could see it. But these cities and others are ambitious in driving change, and they are ambitious in how they engage with design. And they have also established teams and labs and units 
embedding design skills at the same time as they've, to some extent, collaborated with external design consultancies. So here are the different uh, innovation teams and labs in the Danish context that we've seen emerging and calling probably being the uh, most powerful example because of the commitment by the local government to make design a strategic uh, cross-cutting uh, capability, but also the collaboration between the school here, uh, Design to Innovate, which is the, uh, the cluster, the design cluster here, and then uh, local government. So that's a very powerful triangle that they've created, and that's, that's I think, is, uh, is, is showcasing how far you can go. And, and they are not, not finished yet, I don't think. Um, so how did, how did the, the, the scaling of design, at least until today, happen in Denmark? And I think, first of all, part of the background is that Denmark and, uh, does have a very well-run public sector. We have our challenges, and we talk about them all the time. Some of them are big, some of them are smaller, some are smaller in international comparison. But having a well-run public sector, not corrupt, pretty well governed, transparent, democratic, that probably opens up for at least these types of design that are collaborative and engaging and so forth. That's one, I think, part of the Danish story, which is, of course could go for a lot of countries in the world, but arguably also some countries where it's more uncomfortable. And I would say that collaborative citizen engagement by design becomes challenging in countries that have a less of a democratic culture because ultimately that is going to challenge existing power structures and existing systems. So that's something to be, be aware of, I think. Another part of the Danish uh, experience is uh, you could call it luck or you could call it uh, visionary leadership. But when you look at the pattern in the last 10, 15 years, there have been leaders around, there have been managers making decisions to say, we will try this, we will engage with design and we will invest in design. Everything from running a 400 million kroner program on user-driven innovation that definitely powered both design and anthropology to establishing MindLab or to establishing other teams, to establishing the innovation house in, uh, in Copenhagen or to, to, to driving the, the, uh, the, the narrative and the vision here in Kolding. Uh, so I think visionary leadership on behalf of, um, of government organizations or social organizations. Right now we're seeing the philanthropy Real Dania show very big leadership and vision in uh, establishing the uh, innovation hub, Blocks Hub in Copenhagen as well. And finally, patience. I have seen a lot of initiatives for, with the Sign for Social Innovation start and go away again. New Zealand used to have a Center for Social Innovation. Australia used to have a, a design team, design lab in Canberra in the government. But if you set aside one year's budget or a year and a half or two years and then you want metrics and you want the data and you want all the documentation, then you might get disappointed. And I've seen too much uh, sort of uh, political uh, maneuvering or uh, not enough uh, robustness or, uh, or not enough uh, long-term uh, vision. And, and so I think that design for social innovation is a long-term game because the impacts you see take time. The other day, I, I opened my, my phone and uh, to, to check out uh, what is the tax uh, administration in Denmark doing for young people. And the reason I opened up my phone to check it out on the internet was that five years ago, MindLab did a major project on young people and understanding taxation and, and doing the personal taxes. And it took about four years from that project and that, those insights until the website was up and running. And now it's taken another couple of years for the website to actually look like it's something made in the, in, in the 2010s. But it's there now, and it's, it, it's pretty cool. It even has a little video and everything. This is the tax uh, office. Uh, but it takes time. And I think we need long-term patience when it comes to social innovation. It's a different thing than innovation for the next uh, uh, quarterly uh, profits or for the next, uh, next product. Finally, uh, I can't uh, present to you today, this morning, without sharing just a high-level insight on uh, where is this all heading. Because the big game for design for social innovation is not about projects. It's not about standalone solutions. It's not about transforming a single service. The big game in design for social innovation is transforming how we do social change. It's transforming how we do government. It's transforming how we do civic organizations. It's transforming how we collaborate across a society to make it better. That's what the game is about. And so this is not the end result, but this is an emerging set of of uh, principles that I believe are emerging from design work in government, in social organizations that will characterize and must characterize 
how we run uh, any organization that's achieve, trying to achieve social impact. Uh, so, uh, and oh, by the way, when I say that, this is the disclaimer, we won't get rid of bureaucracy anyway. We won't get rid of hierarchy, we won't get rid of the need for accountability, we won't get need of checks and balances and all that stuff. But given that bureaucracy is here to stay, how can we create an alternative model that uh, ameliorates its, uh, its uh, shortcomings and maybe makes bureaucracy more human-centered? Uh, so here are the four principles. A much more relational uh, government, relational uh, work, shifting and reframing what we do towards outcomes for citizens, towards engagement with people, understanding that any social change is about relationships. It's not about just transactions. It's not about the money. It's not about the social support. It's about long-term uh, facilitation of change in people's, in families, in organizations' lives. It's about network for real, engaging other resources, citizens' resources, other parts of society, orchestrating those network resources around outcomes. And it's about, and this is where design is so, so, so critical, it's about understanding at a totally micro level what are the interactions at a human level, at a, across service touch points, across systems, across physical and immaterial, what is it that drives behavior? What drives meaning? What drives experience? What drives outcomes? How can we be much, much more precise, much more sophisticated, and much more humble about how to emerge and challenge those interactions as we develop what we do? And finally, it's about reflection, which means creating learning organizations that learn not just from analytics and big data, but learn from the human experience and learn from subjective experience. So let me, uh, let me end uh, my, my, uh, my presentation this morning uh, with, uh, uh, with an example. So this is an example I heard only yesterday. And it's an example that is from an organization that does not have a design language. Uh, but it is an organization that is increasingly uh, uh, doing the next governance, that is sort of practicing a lot of what we talked about today. So this is, and this is a surprising part of social innovation, by the way, because this is the police. It's the police of Northern Zealand and Denmark. Uh, and I was uh, speaking together yesterday uh, and keynoting with the uh, head, head of uh, one of the uh, leaders and uh, the chief of the police up there. And this is an image uh, of a, a young boy, Storm, a Danish kid. And this is a big image of his blue bicycle. And before I tell the story, I should say that the police has discovered that the way to create safety and the way to deal with uh, challenges in that region is to collaborate creating new partnerships with local uh, housing authorities, housing communities. It's uh, creating partnerships with the mayor of the cities. It's creating partnerships with citizens, with schools, with social services. And it's, by the way, also uh, using social media in a massive way. They won the national award for the best, it's called the language award for the best way of articulating uh, language because they have a very humoristic uh, Facebook page where they write about all kinds of events happening that's going on in police work. They also are very nice to send out Twitter messages. This morning, for example, I saw that there's a, uh, um, a traffic control up in one of the uh, highways and then they're sending out a, tw a tweet saying, we have traffic control, drive safely, don't drive more than 40 kilometers an hour, otherwise we'll get you. It's a nice thing to know. <laughs> At least if you don't always follow the <laughs> speed limit. So the story here is that uh, the police is on Facebook and Storm with the blue bicycle goes missing. And they put out a Facebook post saying, two-year-old kid, uh, he's gone and the family doesn't know where he is. And he, doesn't, he can't really tell who he is, where he lives, and doesn't really, you know, he can't find his way home. He's missing. That Facebook post, uh, speaking of network and interactions, got two million views in a country of five million people same day. It had, uh, I think, 5,000 comments same day. And this is where the police needed to go into a new way of governing by network and collaboration, because the same day, 2,000 people show up in Storm's neighborhood to go looking for him. Some people are driving from Odense, which is 150 kilometers away. Storm still is missing when it gets dark. Storm is still missing at midnight. There are citizens out there with um, headlights and lamps and uh, flashlights looking for him. And at 2 a.m. at night, they find him alive, sleeping under a tree somewhere, and bringing him home. And the Facebook updates get a another million views from that. So this is a different way of doing police work. 
it's a different way of governing, it's a different way of collaborating, and you can argue that that is really human-centered design at work. That's not what they call it up there, but that's what they're doing. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Christian. You're off to our new conference. We would like you to wear this. Oh, because beautiful. Yeah, because then we can all see that you created impact here with us. And we have a small gift. Oops. What? Thank you. Thank you. Have a good conference.